Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Join us on our journey into the past, the present, and the future as we explore the relationship between technology and humanity. Together, we are going to find out what it means to live in a society where everything is connected and the only constant is change. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Nintex is the global standard for business process management and automation. The Nintex platform helps their clients accelerate progress on their digital transformation journeys by quickly and easily managing, automating, and optimizing business processes. Learn more at Nintex.com. Blue Lava is the first business platform for CISOs to manage their security program. Blue Lava guides security leaders to effectively measure, optimize, and communicate their security program with confidence and ease in one platform. Learn more at bluelava.net. Now I'm in the different browser. I... Different browser? Yep. Is it the browser from the future? I do not know. It didn't come with a label. It didn't <laughs> say future, past, no. I don't know. It's the one no, that no, works. Uh, everything, everything just gets streamed to your brain. That's it. And then your brain freezes. <laughs> that's why you have to reboot the brain there's yeah, always gonna it. be there's always gonna be something right so maybe if we yeah. keep it separated we can kind of yeah. like keep uh, balancing thing and if we converge right. everything in one thing what if that goes wrong <laughs> right yeah that's single point that's of failure. It. turn it on and off again artificial super intelligence trying to take over the world there you go flick it <laughs> off there you go <laughs> well, okay. That's right. All right. I think there's always, uh, there's always a power switch. Exactly. I think the audience is already getting the point that we are about to have fun. We are about to talk about the future, which if they know well as as well enough, they know we like to do that. We 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 like to look at the past, to look at the present, and then trying to see what uh, the future scenarios may may be. As a matter of fact, Sean, this is Audio Signals podcast, but. Uh, we also used to do, and we're bringing it back, I think, right now, the segment that we call the future of the future. So we not only we look in the future, but we look in the future of the future. So, Matthew, I hope you're going to help us with that. <laughs> uh, we can help you. That's it. Futures in futures in futures. <laughs> that's right. And that, that sounds like money to me. <laughs> Especially if you're Jeff Bezos. That's it. He, need, exactly. he needs money for it. But he needs money for his next space flight. Apparently, it costs five hundred million dollars per minute. So I think it needs quite a lot. <laughs> I think he needs quite a lot for his next space flight. That's uh, definitely a step in the future that uh, Branson and him they just took right now. We don't know how how is that going to yeah. go, but we'll we'll talk about that uh, as well. But Sean, let's 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 go back to a little bit of a standard introduction here. Although I I like it caliphic like that so i don't have yeah, a problem my, i mean my brain is already f fried <laughs> from all the thoughts just like well, what's the breakdown of that cost <laughs> how much of it is in fuel we'll, <laughs> we'll get there yeah, we will get there all right let, before we do that though uh, i'm thrilled to introduce matthew griffin who is guess what a futurist yes <laughs> so he's looking at all kinds of stuff uh and talking about it everywhere. I mean, and including governments around the world and, and innovators around the world. And I mean, yeah, I mean, Matthew, you're, you're doing a ton. We we've connected with you through our good friends, the mentor project. And yeah. uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you on audio signals today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. No, great to be here. So uh, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> And to, because clearly I'm not giving a good background for all the stuff you're doing. <laughs> a few minutes for you, for you to share a few thoughts with our audience so they know who, who they're hearing on the other end here. Yeah. Okay. So I suppose, basically, in a nutshell, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute and the World Futures Forum. So the 311 Institute is a futures and deep futures think tank and advisory. Now, what I mean by that is we look anywhere from the present day to 50 years out. 
So if you're typically a multinational, you're going to be looking at about the next 20 years. So I work with organizations like Disney, T-Mobile, Arm, Samsung, all the companies that you're typically going to be using right now, basically, to actually record this, listen to this, watch this and everything else. And um, the reason why I go between 20 to 50 years out is because if you're a sovereign government, then you typically care about the future of energy, jobs, skills, education, infrastructure, you know, the next general election, you know, all those kinds of funky things. So uh, so that's kind of the one side. And I cover all sectors and I look at over 450 emerging technologies, everything from AI to nanotech to brain machine interfaces, you name it, we can have a riot down there. And then I also uh, I also head up the World Futures Forum, and that's more of a philanthropic organization where we look to bring together really sort of thought leaders and decision makers from around the world, typically G7, G20 prime ministers and ministers and governments to try to solve the world's greatest challenges. So that's everything from things like education, future of water, future of energy, poverty, uh, things that align really with, with the United Nations SDG 17 goals. Um, and that's it. That's all I do. That, and the occasional bit of traveling, especially when there's not the odd pandemic hanging <laughs> and around. Then, and so you're I'm probably gonna... really bored about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> with all well, of those thinking. I'm going to add another yeah. spectrum. Yeah. I'm going to add another spectrum because... <laughs> There's multiple, I mean, so if, if that's a stack of stuff, right, and you, you didn't even list all the things you're doing, I'm sure. Let, let's flip it on its side, and, and I'm wondering how much of it is risk-based views versus, uh, yeah, building sustainable uh, society views versus let's just innovate for the heck of innovating views yeah. we want to see what's possible and there's probably some gray areas in between those those different realms as well so, yeah so i mean if you look at this if you look at the spectrum of you know the future from an individual perspective typically you've got startups that are trying to make the impossible possible um so that's everything for example from building vertical farms and transforming and revolutionizing agriculture with things like clean meat where you take a feather from a chicken put it into something called a bioreactor you grow that the cells from that feather into chicken nuggets, which you can now buy in Singapore, as well as down from Walmart in the US. And now what you have is you have clean meat without ever having to kill an animal, but it's not plant-based meat, it's actually real meat. Uh, so you kind of got those kinds of things. So as I say, you've got startups and entrepreneurs that are trying to do the impossible. And that's before we get anywhere near holograms, tractor beams, lightsabers, and all those kinds of things. And for the audience that's listening, if you want to know whether or not lightsabers are possible, they are. They're called plasma jets. The Chinese have invented one for surgery. Um, so that's actually for robo surgery, which is a whole other conversation in itself. They're about an inch high, but they are actually yeah, lightsabers. So we kind of go all the way from that sort of thing, all the way then through to, uh, should we say, sort of more... Uh, sort of grand wars schemes. You know, when you have a look at a lot of the sovereign governments, more and more sovereign governments, whether it's the UAE, whether it's the US, whether it's Europe, whether it's Singapore, whether it's China, particularly China on steroids at the moment, um, they see the future as this land of opportunity that will help them increase their GDPs, increase the the livelihoods of their of their citizens. So. Um, and then really you have everything else in the middle. You know, you've got companies like Microsoft who are sort of innovating future of artificial intelligence, workplace, workforce. Uh, you've got NVIDIA innovating future of artificial intelligence as well. You've got T-Mobile with 5G. You've got 6G coming off the back of all of that kind of stuff. Um, you've got the space race, as we've sort of been seeing in the press at the minute with Bezos and Virgin Galactic, which is a whole conversation in itself. You've got Elon Musk disrupting the global telecommunications market by sending up 12,000 space satellites into low Earth orbit to blanket the Earth in essentially sort of 4G, 5G type uh, global Internet coverage, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's this real sort of wormhole when you get into it. And we're not scratching the surface. So... We, with all of these already, your, your head is full of imagination and what can it be, why we don't have flying cars like the Jetson. I like to use that uh, example yeah. all the time. But at the same time, I mean, the, the future doesn't happen, in, as you're saying, doesn't happen in one particular field or one particular spot. I mean, we, we look at the future, yeah. it, it's who we are going to be, right? So yeah. we can look at a lot of different things, individual, company, government. Based on your experience, and I'm sure the answer is different depending on who you talk to, but if you had to say, 
you know, we really need to focus on this, I don't know, five, 10 things, whatever. You pick the number. I mean, what, what are really yeah. those priority that we, we should yeah. look first? Um, so uh, from a civilization perspective, the first thing you want to do basically is get your education and healthcare systems right. Because if people have to worry about future jobs, future income and their health, then they're not going to be focused on the bigger picture of innovating and doing other things like solving societal challenges, for example. Um, when you start having a look at um, when you start having a look at things at a sort of more granular level, people really need to get their heads around the speed of change. So we call it exponential rate of change. Um, a simple example of this is if you step back, say, 40 years ago, we didn't have the Internet. Now we do. If you step back 10 years ago and have a look at the technologies that we're all using 10 years ago, they're very, very different to what we have today. Similarly, you step forward another 10 years, basically, and those technologies are more capable, they're more powerful, they're more ubiquitous, and they're cheaper. Um, so a very good example of that, for example, a very good example of that is energy. You know, when we have a look at solar, if you step back 10 years ago, solar panels were typically relatively inefficient. They're about 17% inefficient, 17% efficient for a silicon solar panel. But we now, thanks to, for example, the, uh, the US Department of Energy, we've got silicon solar panels that are now 48% efficient in the labs. We've got bacterial solar panels that are 50% efficient carbon nanotube solar panels, basically, that are now about 80% energy efficient. You know, we've got black silicon solar panels coming through from China, which are 132% energy efficient, which is actually possible. That's a conversation in itself. Um, so what we see, for example, the reason why I sort of pick energy as a good example is we are increasing, in the next 10 years, we will increasingly see the cost of generating electricity fall to zero, whereas years ago it would be 20, 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, basically, out of Belgium, we're at about one cent per kilowatt hour. Out of the UAE, we're at about 0.2 cents per kilowatt hour. So the societal impact, basically, of what happens when energy generation is free is significant. Um, you know, you've got to distribute it and everything else. But nevertheless, you know, what happens, basically, to your business when the cost of generating electricity for your massive industrial plant is essentially zero, or you can make a profit from it from selling it. So the first thing is we've got extreme speed. Um, secondly, don't think about individual technologies. Think about combinations. You know, if you have a look at your smartphone, it's a great example of what you can do when you combine different powerful technologies together. You've got a better screen, faster chips, computer chips in phones basically are going to be artificially intelligent powered very, very soon. Uh, you've got faster memory, you've got faster communication chips so and modems. So, for example, we move from 4D, 4G to 5G. Um, yeah. And Matt, so Matthew, those I want to I want to pull on this thread a little bit because yeah. I was actually going to take you down the system system route, mm. if you will. Because uh, yeah. because in order to achieve all the things we really want to achieve, it has to be powered, has to be connected. Yeah. You have to have the the, the communications and mm -hmm. then all the things that make it possible and then obviously software and whatnot yeah how how do, how do we arrive to a point where there is a system because you described the phone right there's two different models yeah. there's the open model for the phone and the closed model and yeah uh, do we see something a uh, closed future and an open future or how, how, do, how does that break down yeah. So, I mean, if you so if you have a look at the open system, so Android, for example, is an open system. Now, when you have a look at the benefits of open systems, yeah, you know, Android, you know, Google will push out Android, and then lots of developers can start forking Android, innovating new features, creating new versions of it, and they can start pushing that out. So, open open ecosystems typically are a very, very good way, basically, to foster new innovation. Um, the closed system, not so much, because like Apple, you are relying, basically, on one company to come up with all of the innovations and then actually put those into the system, you know, put those into the OS, for example. However, as we increasingly look into the future, you know, the open system, while it allows innovators to innovate new things, new features, new benefits, et cetera, et cetera, new use cases, Inherently, they are less controlled, they're less secure, they are more open to systemic abuse, 
which is exactly what we see with Android. Um, whereas the closed system is more controlled uh, because it's procedural based, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So both systems have actually got their place. Um, and inevitably, you know, when we have a look at open systems, this sort of happens. You know, if you have a look at GitHub, uh, if you have a look at Kaggle, if you have a look argue, arguably at sort of Red Hat, what you have is you have a whole variety of different developers coming together to develop an open set of standards for something. Those ecosystems and those communities get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the market adoption of their technologies basically improves over time. Basically, and again, their market gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The number of users they have gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, you end up with very large multinational organizations like Google, Microsoft, and IBM who come in and say, well done on building such a fantastic open source community with hundreds of millions of customers. Uh, we will buy this thing from you. You know, so for example, with Red Hat, Red Hat is obviously a fork of Linux that was then sort of, you know, commercialized a little bit, but in a in a sort of in a relatively using a relatively innovative business model, but they swooped in. GitHub, exactly the same thing, you know, where you ended up with a lot of developers producing open source code that could be used by a lot of other developers. Microsoft bought them. Kaggle, machine learning and artificial intelligence development, you know, there. Uh, then you've also got companies like Singularity Network that are trying to actually open source artificial intelligence tools. But because they have a single point of contact, because they're a company that ultimately are trying to build this open ecosystem for future artificial intelligence development, there's nothing, nothing stopping a company coming in and saying, we'll give you a couple of billion for your community, and then they walk off with it. Um, so open ecosystems only go so far. Uh, and increasingly, as we start seeing the lot, particularly the larger enterprise like tech organizations gobble them up, um, you just they kind of end up sort of like an like an amoeba. You know, these open source ecosystems eventually get absorbed by these large sort of public private organizations that then fork them, that then turn them to their own, bend them to their own will in a variety of different guises. And all of a sudden, it's no longer really open source. So now another community springs up to try to fix that problem. And off we go again, and the cycle repeats. And do, do you see different regions around the world favoring, I think I know the answer, but favoring closed over open? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, so when you have a look at the West, you know, the West basically is 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 really basically an increasingly entrepreneurial place to be. Um, as an entrepreneur, basically, you can go out, you can create anything, basically, and then if the governments don't like it, uh, you <laughs> I was going to say something rude. If the governments don't like it, you know, it's kind of tough. Yeah, and we've seen that, for example, not just in the open source community. We've seen that with companies like Airbnb and Uber who went off, built something. The regulators and the governments then came in and said, you can't do that. And they said, we already have tens of millions of customers what are you going to do? Shut us down? And the governments went, mm, let's actually work together then to regulate you. And uh, at that point, companies like Uber are like, OK, you know, well, uh, that sounds good. You know, let's work hand in glove. Um, but realistically, you know, Uber are wearing the size 12 boot. Um, now, when you have a look at China, for example, and sort of more autocratic states, um, when you actually walk around China, basically on the ground, there's a huge amount of innovation. The government basically is spending $1.4 trillion over the next five years fostering innovation across a variety of different emerging technology areas like AI, quantum, semicon semiconductors, et cetera, et cetera. And that's compared to the US's $400 billion, by the way, and Europe's $600 billion. So guess who's pumping in a huge amount of money to try to win the future that we talked about earlier? But when you have a look at China, for example, there's all this busyness on the ground from an innovation perspective. And the Chinese government actually accepts that and fosters it to a degree. But when those companies get to a particular size, when they start getting to the point where they where their influence and power starts affecting the CPC, which is the, the Communist ruling party, uh, just as we saw with Jack Ma, with Tennyson, so Jack Ma with Alibaba, but also Tencent and other organizations, all of a sudden the government comes in and says, we're going to split you up. We're going to put these new regulations in place. And unlike the US, where we kind of let the tech giants really just rule the roost, in China they get trodden on. They get broken up. They get crushed. Billionaires typically end up 
not being billionaires as they start seeing their share prices fall. The recent DD IPO, for example, was a great example of that, along with the disappearance of Jack Ma for a period of time, while he is typically sent away basically to have conversations with a ruling CPC party about his untoward behavior towards the financial regulators in his case. So you do have these two different approaches. You know, when you have a look at China, you've got huge state-sponsored innovation ecosystems being built up. They are very purposeful. They're very focused. And they are focused on beating the U.S. and getting ahead of the U.S. by at least two generations. You know, hypersonic technology is another great example of that, where we're already seeing China two generations ahead of the U.S. in hypersonics. But in the U.S., the U.S. as well as the West, generally, innovation is a little bit more of a messier process. And you can kind of argue basically that that sort of messiness is actually what then spawns some of these larger organizations and some of these weird things that you wouldn't necessarily see springing up elsewhere. Um, I mean, I came across one the other day, basically, that's a a big company now. Uh, It's a company that produces a sports bag that produces ozone within the bag so your trainers don't smell. I mean, you know, the... In the West, innovation is quite a messy and chaotic and sort of fun experience. And if you want to, and if you're skilled enough, you can scale these to big companies without too much fear of the government basically actually splitting you apart. And uh, again, you know, when we have a look at the US government's uh, approach to Facebook, when Mark Zuckerberg sat in front of the Senate, everyone said it was like watching Mark Zuckerberg explaining technology to my grandparents. So when you have a look at US reg- where the US regulators sit, when it comes to their policing and their their policy development of new emerging technologies and capabilities and use cases and things, we don't have too much to fear about because, frankly, they have no idea what they're actually looking at or what's coming. Which is and where if I we, come from. And if we think that they will make finally, ultimately, the decision, that's kind of scary, as you said. But listen. Oh, yeah. We, we could have gone in so many different directions here from talking about gadgets or, you know, health or uh, anything, right? Communication. You went to my favorite field, which is kind of like the future scenario and who is going to win the future. And from a political perspective, and from what you said, it seems to me that Policy and, and government are kind of the one that may be the one deciding who wins. So China, you said, is investing so much, they have a plan. And yeah. here we let the economy decide and, and it's kind of like scattered. So if I had to bet money on someone right now, maybe, I don't know, not, not that I want to, but I, yeah. I would see like a, a little bit of a plan to help with this. But... So my question is, as we look at 50 years from now or the future, and of course, Sean, you know this was coming, is it dystopian or is it a utopian future? Are we being positive about it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is where, ironically, the thing that makes the difference between whether you live in a utopia or a dystopia is the government that you are either under or the government you elect. That's it. Um, from a technology, so giving you a couple of examples, basically from a technology perspective, I now have enough emerging technologies, basically where I can surveil everything you do online. We know that already. That's nothing new. I have a whole plethora of technologies that allow me to monitor you offline. If you think about the Alexa speaker that's uh, or the Google speaker that's actually in your kitchen. They can listen to you. They can listen to your voice. Basically, they can tell you when you're getting ill. They can tell you when you're likely to get a heart attack because when you ha- when you get ill and when you have a heart attack, your voice box changes. Um, same with COVID. We can tell via your voice if you have COVID or are getting COVID. Um, we can tell if you have depression, PTSD, or dementia just from your voice. Um, so these surveillance-like technologies are everywhere. I can use artificial intelligence to turn your Wi-Fi, courtesy of MIT, into a sonar-like device that not only tells me exactly where you are in the house, it can tell me how you are walking. Uh, because I can tell how you are walking, it's a little bit like radar and sonar for uh, submarines. Because I can tell what your gait is, how you're walking, I can tell whether or not you are taking your medicine. 
um, or whether or not you have pos postural problems. I can tell your emotions with a 96% accuracy from your Wi-Fi signal. So now think what I could do basically with the CCTV on the street, with the persistent surveillance drones that are 30,000 feet above, I think that one's Chicago or Boston, um, let alone all these other things. So from a dystopian perspective, when I join all these different systems up, as they actually are and kind of have in China, if you drop litter in China, um, a camera picks it up, uses facial recognition, identifies you. It then uses the national ID scheme to figure out who you actually are. And then it docks your social credit score. So your social credit score is a system that's been designed by the Chinese government. Uh, and it gives you a rating based on how well behaved you are. Now, the interesting thing with the social credit scoring system is if you drop into the red, you get banned from healthcare, financial services, broadband, high speed travel, internet, uh, international travel, particular schools. This is already happening. You can go and have a look on Google and other information sources are available. But the interesting thing with the social scoring system is if you are not a good communist party player, your score gets docked. So this is why I say it is down to the governments, because while we while a social credit scoring system is an interesting idea, you know, we don't want people littering or punching people in the street. That's bad. They should probably get punished for that. The concept of actually introducing a political element into the social credit scoring system, that means if you do not support me, my government, my policies, I'm going to ban you from high speed travel. I'm going to ban your children from going to particular schools. Now we're starting to get into that dystopian state territory. And by um, the way, this uh, is 1984 from George Orwell uh, yeah. sequel. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, I mean, yeah, when you have a look at 19, you know, when you have a look at 1984, um, as I say, these technologies already exist. I did a keynote on the future of privacy and a sort of mix of other bits and bobs. And you'd just be staggered at how much we can tell just from a webcam feed, from your voice. You know, if you're wearing a mask, for example, is a lot of rioters sort of like, you know, and anarchists basically like wearing masks. You know, companies like Facebook can still identify you just from your eyes. So, you know, so everyone basically is running around the streets doing things, thinking I'm fine because I'm actually covered in a duvet. Uh, we can tell how you're walking, um, you know, and we can tell it's from you from how you're walking. You know, so this is kind of NSA, FBI kind of stuff. But this is commercial technology now that's being embedded into really the fabric of our society. But while we have all these technologies to surveil you, to figure out what you're doing online, who you're meeting, I can use GPS on your phones to figure out you're meeting these people and you're probably doing something naughty because this is a naughty person and, um, you know, you're meeting them. Um, it's down to the government and the government policies that then determine whether or not you live in a dystopia or a utopia. And that's the danger. So as we see deep fakes from, for example, Russia, and uh, Eastern Europe increasingly try to undermine Western democracy. The danger is that the people who get into government within the Western democracies are typically dystopian lead leaning, shall we say, and then you end up in a dystopia. And the greatest thing that you can value, so I, tra I travel the world, the greatest thing that people should value is freedom. And it's not easy, it's a sticky, sticky, horrible mess. Uh, that causes regulators and governments and individuals basically nightmares on a daily basis. But when you go to some of these more authoritarian countries, you can't speak your mind in the same way that you can, for example, in, in the West. Uh, you don't have this. They don't have the same freedoms. And then you are in an Orwellian dystopian novel. So, Matthew, the, you, you, you paint say. a picture led by government with with people in it. Um, hmm. I, I, I want to understand your view of that that picture. We I think we automatically think of Earth, yeah, right? the planet, the planet Earth. But yeah. we've we've been launching things and people into space now, and there are other planets we're exploring. And I'm I'm wondering, what about the environment? Because and then I want yeah. to connect it to the investment that the China's making. Are, are there investments that we are not making that we need yeah. to make? 
rather beyond just innovating to to yeah. shore up a government and and its people. Oh, no. Absolutely. So, I mean, so when you have a look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 in all. One of them is partnerships. So really, there are 16 and they deal with everything from future of education and workforce all the way through to equality, water, poverty, energy, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, climate change, oceans. There's a huge amount, basically, that from a societal perspective that we need to be doing. So the first one, which is sort of one that I kind of try to focus on with the World Futures Forum, basically, is actually trying to balance out inequality. Yeah, we've got the haves and the have nots. Uh, you know, if you have a look at the current space race, that's an that's an ideal example of if you are a billionaire, space is the new billionaire's playground. Um, in fact, I think one of the American uh, one of the American papers the other day put it as um, space is the new billionaire playground because all the billionaires are trying to get off Earth. You know, so um, that's that's sort of one thing. But when you have a look at, for example, climate change, increasingly we already have the technology today at a relatively affordable and commercial scale to eliminate over 70 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. So we'll break that down. Agriculture accounts for about 20 percent of all greenhouse gases. Um, those are typically cows, crops, uh, feet making the. You know, growing crops to feed to cows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, land use, deforestation, all that sort of stuff. Um, vertical farms and clean meat actually take the amount of greenhouse gas emissions down by 99% for the agricultural sector. Next, we have the energy sector, which is about another sort of 15 to 20%. Uh, most of the energy that we use actually goes on heating. We've got zero energy air conditioning systems, courtesy of University of Stanford, or Stanford U. Um, from a renewable energy perspective, we now have one trillion watts of energy and of renewable energy capacity installed around the world. We need about six trillion watts. So we're actually doing all right. And the cost of energy is plummeting as we start pivoting off fossil fuels and oil and gas. Um, when we have a look at transportation, transportation, again, another sort of 15 to 20 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we are electrifying our autos and our transportation networks and systems. And again, the, in, the innovations that we see in the energy sector actually feed through to the electric vehicle sector. Autonomous vehicles should take about 30% of the traffic off the roads, et cetera there. Even when we have a look at concrete, concrete actually accounts for about 5% of all global greenhouse gas emissions, particularly CO2. We actually have new types of green concrete that actually don't use don't use CO2 and don't emit CO2 during the manufacturing process. So we've got, this is just the sort of tip of the iceberg of this conversation, but we've got all these different innovations and technologies and solutions already here to help us decarbonize 70% of all greenhouse gases. So that's kind of climate change, but the problem we have with climate change is that lag. You know, we've got massive ocean acidification, we've got warming oceans, that's going to take a long time to reverse. So frankly, we're in trouble. We're headed to hot house earth. You know, I'm sitting here today basically in my 50 degree C studio, like you guys are, other than you, Marco. I see you've got some nice air conditioning there. Um, and then when we have a look at sustainability, basically we've got the circular economy. Adidas basically is sort of doing doing really well basically on the circular economy where they are, they've been designing new materials that can be just continuously recycled. We've got biodegradable plastics coming through. Um, there's loads, you know, when you have a look at sustainability as a whole, there are so many different solutions. It's insane. But the reason why we aren't don't appear to be making too much of a difference is because there is a difference between having the technology and the solution available and using and deploying it. And it's that where the lag is, which is where we then get into, in, you know, into investment, whether it's private equity, hedge funds, global asset managers, governments, that kind of stuff, um, or whether it's policy or regulation or whatever it happens to be. Right. And that's exactly what I was going to say. And that's where we go full circles and we go back into the decision making and how we influence eventually them as a public opinion with knowledge and learning all these things in order to... Yeah to put some pressure on that. We know you have a hard stop. Uh, you got uh, present things to worry about. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to let you go with hopefully the, the idea to get together again, maybe to talk yeah, about look forward to it. Yeah, some other things and maybe we'll stay more focused. But I think this yeah. was a nice overall 
uh, thought-provoking conversation for our audience, I, I, I assume. There will be notes and links and uh, resources on the podcast. So we really hope that everybody enjoyed, that we don't scare you guys too much. It's still up in the air. We're not, you know, <laughs> we don't know. We, 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 good view. Exactly. Yeah. Well, hopefully we, we, we still have some control over the future. So. Exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, that's the hope. But knowledge <laughs> well, is the only way. So all right. yeah, well, it. Matthew, thank you so, so much. And uh, thank you to the Mentor Project connecting yeah. us. And uh, we, again, we'll look forward yeah. to talk to you again soon. Well, always a pleasure. That's it. Stay cool. That's it. I can hear the ice cream truck outside, so I know where I'm headed now. <laughs> we can do this later. And thanks to everyone That's who's your future. Here's Matthew. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> ice cream truck. Done. That's it in about five minutes. Ta-da. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers. Blue Lava is the first business platform for CISOs to manage their security program. Blue Lava guides security leaders to effectively measure, optimize, and communicate their security program with confidence and ease in one platform. Learn more at bluelava.net. Nintex is the global standard for business process management and automation. The Nintex platform helps their clients accelerate progress on their digital transformation journeys by quickly and easily managing, automating, and optimizing business processes. Learn more at Nintex.com. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company, wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.